Welcome back to Dragon Wings as we start chapter six today. Um, in the last chapter, we had some real big drama go on with Black Dog and Wind Rider and Moonshadow, and basically things went down to the point where Wind Rider and Moonshadow have to move away um, to seek protection and to just be a little bit away from things. And so in the last page that we read on page 122, they have officially um, left and they are headed to their new home. So we're going to learn more about that right now on page 123, if you'll follow along with me. Chapter six is called The Demoness and it takes place in May of 1905. In those days, Polk Street was for the poorer demons. There were lots of common little shops like grocery stores or poultry markets and wooden tenement houses, some four stories high into which the poor demons crowded. In the morning, you would he see the demons in undershirts and coats swinging lunch buckets as they walked to the factories and the demonesses hurrying to be on time in the rich mansions one block to the west where they worked as laundresses or housekeepers or housemaids. There would be young demons who were clerks in offices tugging at their stiff celluloid collars as they ran to catch the cable cars and shop girls in their long dresses walking in groups talking in excited voices. All day, the streets would be filled with noise, the sound of the hooves of the great dray horses as they clopped up and down the cobblestones, and the merry ringing of the cable cars on the streets that crossed Polk. The demonesses might be back later in the day, pushing baby carriages or walking with their employer's wives, doing the day's shopping. And in the later afternoon, everyone would come home looking tired, hardly noticing the demons who lit the gas lamps. I had been through streets like Polk Street before we, when we had picked up laundry, but we had only been passing through then. Now we were here to stay. The tenement houses had the same odd, flat faces and the dra same drab colors, making them look all the same as if they had been hatched in the same brood. Their doorways gaped like mouths, and their windows gleamed like eyes, so that each one of them looked like the stark, empty face of a multi-colored, I'm sorry, a multi-eyed demon. We finally stopped in front of a neat little Victorian house with an odd shape. It seemed to have a little more character than the tenement houses. I found out later that it had eight sides instead of being built in the shape of a square. The demon who had built the house had wanted it that way, Actually, it made that house seem all the more scary because behind its iron fence, it looked like some strange beast that had to be kept specially separate and fenced off from the others. It squatted there like some toad made of glass and wood shingles. In one corner was a turret with a big bay window looking out on a small garden surrounded by the fence. Here we are, father said. He picked me up and swung me down to the sidewalk. You watch our things, he added. I watched uncomfortably as he and Handclap each grabbed a box of our belongings and walked into the alley between the iron fence of the house and the tenement next door. When they disappeared from sight, I wasn't sure what to do. On the one hand, I was supposed to watch our boxes, but on the other hand, I didn't want to be alone. I walked cautiously toward the mouth of the alley, but I couldn't see father. It seemed to me at that time that there might be any number of demons waiting in their houses, waiting patiently for me to turn my back so they could leap upon me and take over my body or torture me or do the hundred and one things that demons can do to people. I looked up at that moment and saw a peak demonic face staring down at me from the glass eye of the turret. When it saw me looking, it vanished. I ran back to the wagon. I stayed there all the time clinging to the familiar shape of the company's wagon while father and hand clap unloaded our things. It did not take long since we did not have very much. Hand clap sat on the seat of the wagon for a moment, the reins in his hand, but reluctant to tell Red Rabbit to go. We were just as reluctant. 
We stood on the sidewalk beside the wagon. My hand held on to the side. For want of something to do, Handclap scratched his neck and looked around. Then he began to sniff the air. There's money to be made here by a man with the know-how, he said. I can just smell the gold coins piled in all these houses, and I can just see all these poor demons sitting on top of their heaps of gold, crying because their clock's busted and they don't know how to fix it. They'll be mobbing your place day and night to fix things once they know you're here. Father laughed. Careful, or some jealous demon will wish us bad luck. Handclap sat back in the seat. With that charm I gave you? Listen, if some dumb demon is too ignorant to recognize its power and comes a-knocking at your door, why, you tell me and I'll tell the enlighteners and they'll come flying across the ocean and gobble that demon up from the top of his hair down to his big, ugly feet. You do that. Father slapped Handclap's leg. Now you better be going. Red Rabbit looks hungry. He's always hungry, Handclap said. Remember, though, I said, he likes a carrot in the morning. I'll remember, Handclap nodded a goodbye to Father and winked at me. Then he shook the reins, but Red Rabbit would not leave. He looked around at Father as if telling him to get back on the wagon. Go on, you fat, overgrown, sassy rabbit, Handclap ordered as he shook the reins. But Red Rabbit stayed, or stubbornly stayed put. Get out of here before I skin you and make a jacket out of your hide, Father said. And with his hat, he whacked Red Rabbit's rump real good. With a snort of hurt pride, Red Rabbit started in his harness. But then he stayed put. Go on, Father said, and he whacked Red Rabbit even harder. With a sad twist of his head, Red Rabbit turned away from Father and began to clomp along in his slow, methodical pace. From the way he went, you might have thought he was pulling a ton of metal instead of an empty wagon. Together we watched them roll down the cobblestone street and turn the corner. Come along, Father. Sorry, come along. Father put his hand on my shoulder and steered me around to face the alley. We walked past the iron fence and the garden to a big backyard that was filled with trees and grass. A stable stood in one corner of the yard. Father swung the door open. It creaked on its hinges and I could smell the disinfectant Father had used to clean out the stable that morning. In one corner of the room, was a pot-bellied stove with a pipe leading up to the ceiling. Our mats and blankets were laid in one corner. Boards had been propped against one wall for the day when father would build shelves. Until that time, our stuff would stay in our boxes. I wandered around the room and touched everything to reassure myself that it was real and not some demonic illusion. Father waited patiently in the doorway with his arms folded. When I went back to him, I nodded that it was all right. He grinned. The first thing he did was to put up a shelf. Then he set Monkey and the Buddha-to-be on it. He placed the cup of soil before them and stuck some incense sticks into the soil and lit them so that the Monkey and the Buddha-to-be would be comfortable in the pleasant smoke. Finally, Father nodded his head in the direction of the house. Now we have to meet our landlady. Her name is Miss Whitlaw. Miss Whitlaw. I practiced the syllable several times until father sighed. That will have to do for now. Then he spat into his hand and smoothed my hair back. He frowned. How do you ever manage to get so dirty? I washed my face this morning like you told me. Not very well, he said. He picked up an empty pail and went outside. I watched from the doorway as he worked the pump handle until the water splashed into the pail. He came back inside and got some clean hand towels. He threw me one. Now wash, he said. You'd think, I grumbled, that we were visiting the Empress herself. Father wet his towel in the pail and began to wash his face. 
Your mother was always polite to everyone. She always said that you never knew if that person might have been some king or queen in a former life. But these are white demons, I protested. Father opened our trunk and got some out some clean, well-ironed shirts, some of White Deer's masterpieces. You can take that up with your mother when she comes here herself. Until then, we'll do as she says. Understand? I said nothing because I was still annoyed, but I rubbed my face vigorously anyway. In fact, harder than mother used to do it. I was not going to be accused of being unfaithful. When I had changed into my clean shirt, father announced we were ready. Finally, we stepped outside. Standing there in that empty backyard, I was afraid. And then I thought of the old ones. Perhaps they were watching. I had to try to act brave, at least. Father took my hand as if he knew I needed the support, and we started toward the demon house. On the way, he pointed to the outhouse that sat at the end of the dirt lot. Then we went up to the back steps and knocked at the door. Under my shirt, I wore the charm to keep the demons away. I think that the demoness had been waiting for us, because Father had no sooner knocked once than she was opened the door. She was the first demoness that I had ever seen this close up. And I stared. I had expected her to be ten feet tall with blue skin and to have a face covered with warts and earlobes that hung all the way down to her knees so that her earlobes would bounce off of the knee, her knees when she walked. And she might have a pot belly, shiny as a mirror, and big sacks of flesh for breasts, and maybe she would be only wearing a loincloth. Instead, I saw a petite lady, not much bigger than hand clap. She had a large nose, but not absurdly so, and a red face and silver hair. And she wore a long dress of what looked like white cotton, over which she had put a red apron. The dress was freshly starched and crinkled when she moved and smelled good. She had a smile like the listener, she who hears prayers, who refused to release from the cycle of lives until all her brothers and sisters, too, could be freed from sin. Well, she said, well, I looked at her eyes and saw a friendly twinkle in them that made her seem even less threatening. There were demons, after all, who could be kindly disposed. I suddenly felt calm and unafraid as I stood before her. Father nudged me. I bowed carefully and presented our present. It was a paper picture of the stove king who reported to the Lord of Heaven each year about what the family had done, both the good things and the bad things. It was customary each New Year's to bribe the little stove king. Some families offered him cookies and tea, which he could snack on during his journey to heaven. Others took a more direct approach and smeared his face with honey. Still others bought little paper horses and carts so he could ride up to heaven in style. After all these centuries of tender loving care from millions of Tang families, the Stove King had gotten quite pudgy. Father thought it might be a nice gesture to give the picture to the demoness, and I agreed, for the little Stove King might take the demon's ignorance into account and give a good report for them for the Stove King was basically as kind and gentle a person as one was likely to find among the gods. The demon Ness turned it over and over in her hands in puzzlement until Father spoke, he Chinese saint of kitchen. I doubt if the demoness would have had a heathen god inside her kitchen, but a holy man was a different matter. Well, isn't that nice? She smiled pleasantly and stepped aside from the door. Please, do come in. We sat down at a table covered with a, cherry, a cheery red checkered tablecloth in a cold, abstract arrangement of squares, the kind of pattern the demons favored. And of course, all the smells to her kitchen were different. The demoness went to her icebox, a strange device, 
and took out a pitcher and poured a large glass of some white liquid for me. For herself and for father, she made tea, using water from a copper tea kettle that she must have already boiled and set at the edge of the stove to keep hot. Then the demoness set down the biggest plate of things before me. They were brown colored and shaped like men, and icing had been used to make eyes, nose, and button coats. There, it sounded like gingerbread cookies, she said. I looked to father to explain the demonic word, which I did not know. Gingerbread, father said slowly. It's a kind of sweet ginger-flavored cookie or cake. And what's this stuff? I looked dubiously at the glass of thick white liquid. Cow's milk. I almost made a face, but caught myself. But that's cow urine. No, no, stupid. Milk comes from the cow's udders. Now drink it. You must not offend the lady. I glanced at the demoness. She smiled at me. It was nice of her to think of me as a demon child, I guess. I sipped the liquid and managed not to make a face at the awful, greasy taste. Go on and have a cookie, Father ordered me sternly, and you better eat all of it. The milk did not make me much inclined to trust the demoness's cookies much. They look like dung, I said. I don't care if it is dung. She made it, you eat it. I will if you will. Father sighed. He turned to the demoness. May I? Certainly, she said with a gracious smile. Father took one of the cookies and munched at it. Well, he did not change into a toad or anything, and he did not throw up. I had been expecting either possibility. I tried one of the cookies on the plate before me. The taste was heavenly. I gobbled up one and started for another. Hey, father snapped. First, you don't want any. Now you want to gobble them all up like a pig? Go on, the demoness pushed the plate closer to me. She smiled in real pleasure. I suddenly liked the way all her wrinkles in her face crinkled up in tiny smiles. I had another cookie. And then I was so thirsty that even the white stuff did not taste so bad this time. Father and the demoness talked politely about the neighborhood. Where was the best place to shop for what? The demoness seemed genuinely to want to help us, and I began to think that she was one of the good demons. I looked about her kitchen. Curiosity got the better of politeness. When I finally finished looking around her kitchen, I realized I had gone through four more of the cookies. Father noticed the almost empty plate at the same time. Look at this boy, he said in exasperation. He eat enough for four pigs. He started to apologize to the demoness, but she only smiled prettily again. There's only one real compliment for a cook, and that's for her guests to eat everything up. You must take the rest of the cookies with you. She smoothed her apron over her lap and winked at me secretly. You too kind, father spread his hands. You make us ashamed. He kicked me gently under the table. Yes, a shame, I piped up. We're going to pause there and we'll learn more about their first interaction with their new roommates, pretty much. Miss um, Whitlaw is the one who is allowing them to stay at her home. So they're going to get to know her pretty well. We'll see what else happens next time we read.